one more minute for more people to join in. So please bear with us and we'll be starting shortly. And th this meeting is being recorded. Right. Um, good afternoon, good evening, um, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of my co-convener, Professor Anna Evert and my own. We would like to welcome you to the third lecture uh, in the invited lecture series in bilingualism and multilingualism. And the series is organized jointly by the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences and Humanities, by the Faculty of English at Adam Mickiewicz University, Poznan, and by Multilingualism Matters at Poznan. And together with Anna, we have convened a series of eight lectures, open lectures by outstanding researchers, distinguished scholars, and world experts in the field of bilingualism and multilingualism. And the lectures are delivered via the Zoom platform and are live streamed also on the Facebook of the Faculty of English. Uh, they're also followed by a seminar type meeting for the students and doctoral students, but that's a separate meeting. And today it's our great honor and privilege to welcome uh, Professor Jean-Marc Deval from University of London, Berbe, and uh, our dear friend and colleague, and it's been such a pleasure for us that you accepted our invitation. And uh, I guess you do not need a much introduction, Jean-Marc, but um, just a few words, if you allow me. So uh, Professor Jean-Marc Deval is, is Professor of Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism at the University of London, Birkbeck. He is Director of the Center for Multilingual and Multicultural Research. He's former president of the International Association of Multilingualism and former president of Euroslav. At the moment, he's member also of the executive committee of the International Association for Psychology of Language Learning. Um, Professor Deval's research interests are diverse and they relate mostly to individual differences, the social pragmatics, psychology of language learning, foreign language acquisition, multilingualism, learner and teacher emotions. In particular, he focuses on challenges that multilinguals face in communicating and recognizing emotions in different contexts. And today's talk is very much related to this special um, focus of interest, of research interest, as uh, Professor Jean-Marc Deval will be talking about emotional resonance and embodiment of multilinguals languages. So I uh, very well once, uh, once again welcome you very uh, warmly to today's lecture and Jean-Marc, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you Magdalena, it's a, a pleasure to be uh, invited uh, by you all. Uh, it's also a pleasure to see you because we, we haven't seen each other uh, for, for, for a while. Um, and um, I, I guess that one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it is really easy to travel around the world without having to leave your, your uh, office uh, at home. Uh, though I, I would say that I will miss the pierogi, the pierogi uh, that, that you would yeah. probably have invited me to share after Absolutely. Uh, to, to Absolutely. tonight's lecture. So, so yeah, there, there is a price to pay. I, I can't deny that. Um, I will make up for it. We'll make up for it and we'll be very happy to host you in Poznan as soon as possible. That sounds good. <laughs> um, 
before I start uh, the, the PowerPoint, I, I would like uh, to start with a little anecdote. Um, and I'm sure, in fact, um, all, all of you who have um, learned and used foreign languages must have a, a version of the anecdote I'm going to tell you. Uh, I was nine years old um, and I was uh, in a beach hut uh, on a Greek island with my brother and sister and with my parents. And I had just become friends with a, a Greek boy my age who didn't speak any um, English or French or Dutch, although I can't claim that I spoke much English, but I knew a few words of English. Uh, and, and he probably knew just a few words of English too, but it wasn't really enough to communicate. But we, we got along really well and we played and, 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 and it, it's lov lovely, in fact, when you're uh, children that, that play uh, is a language in itself. Uh, but at that point, he um, tricked me uh, into teaching me uh, a Greek word that he wanted me to um, utter in front of his dad, who was sitting there at that table, having an ouzo and drinking, uh, well, drinking an ouzo and, and having some feta uh, and cucumber. Um, and I still remember the moment. Um, and the, the word was um, vlachos in Greek. I thought that I thought that word sounded beautiful, and 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 so I I walk up uh, to the dad and I look him in the eyes and I tell him vlachos and I didn't realize as I was saying that um, that I had just called him an idiot, um, so he went pale and then red, and then he noticed his son smirking in the background and he understood that I was the poor foreign boy who had been tricked into using uh, a Greek swear word that to me had no embodiment at all. It was just uh, a, a funny sound uh, that I made. Uh, and, and then later on, I realized that in fact, the, the dad was a, a, a colonel uh, in the Greek army uh, and it was the time when the, the, the colonels were in power. So it was really not a good idea to insult uh, a colonel having his ouzo uh, at a terrace. And, and only much later did I realize that that uh, little anecdote of my shame uh, at you know, being uh, told off for, for, for using a word I didn't understand um, was in fact a useful anecdote uh, and a useful illustration for the things I got interested in uh, later on uh, in my career, why it is that words seem to have very different weight depending on the language uh, they are linked to and, and how we can um, inadvertently, in fact, hurt people by using words that we don't realize are, are pretty powerful um, and, uh, in, in, in their language. So I will share my screen now and uh, start the PowerPoint. Um, so I, I have to start obviously with uh, some basics and I hope the colleagues who have heard me talk about this in the past will forget, forgive me. Uh, we, we need to define the concepts uh, we use, we, uh, we use uh, and emotion is a particularly uh, slippery concept uh, in the sense that there is no unified uh, definition of uh, emotion. Uh, and as Ledoux pointed out, uh, one of the most significant things ever said about emotion, everybody knows what it is, but it's really, really hard to uh, define it. There are different approaches. Uh, the basic approach, uh, the dimensional approach, within which there is a distinction between appraisal and integrative uh, approach. And I will explain this uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, you may recognize uh, these pictures, um, which uh, are part of the uh, set uh, of pictures used by Paul Ekman and colleagues um, who, um, start a systematic investigation of uh, emotion across the world. 
and, and uh, is the pioneer of the basic and the so-called discrete approach where emotions are seen as discrete functional automatic responses to the environment uh, associated with specific physiological and behavioral reactions. So uh, in that view, uh, there are six basic universal emotions, which means that these six pictures should be recognized by anyone in the world uh, accurately, um, because th there isn't that much variation in the end in, in um, uh, facial expression uh, reflecting basic uh, emotions. So the fundamental uh, belief of uh, psychologists using this approach is that uh, emotion is really a matter of biology uh, and not so much one of culture. <clears throat> then uh, there, there is uh, the <coughs> dimensional uh, approach uh, which uh, contrast with the basic approach in that it sees uh, emotions as combinations of uh, different dimensions, namely valence, uh, which goes from the positive to the negative, uh, arousal, which goes from low uh, or passive to high, uh, which is highly active, and uh, dominance. And um, in, in, in that uh, perspective, dimen the, the dimensions are seen as universal, but not the emotions. Um, I started doing research uh, in uh, this field um, using the basic approach, because not being a psychologist, uh, I, I looked for uh, the, the, the paradigm that seemed most cited and, and that, used, that, that was the, the basic approach. And then bit by bit, I realized that in fact, that approach was incompatible uh, with the things I was interested in because I am interested in acculturation. I'm interested in how um, bilinguals and multilinguals change after exposure and engagement in a culture. So the idea that emotions were in fact universal and that culture played no role was, absolutely uh, made no sense. So I, I, I changed uh, my perspective and adopted uh, the uh, dimensional uh, approach. At this point, I should also uh, add something about uh, the concept of embodiment. And uh, the traditional view uh, in psychology is that cognition is about abstract manipulation of uh, symbols. However, more recently, there's been a more uh, grounded view of cognition, where cognition is grounded in the brain systems of action, perception, and emotion. So cognition and emotion are not two completely separate entities. They are, in fact, uh, linked, um, and, and, and it, it's hard to see one uh, without uh, the other. And uh, my friend Aneta Pavlenko uh, used this perspective uh, to argue that the main difference in emotionality between first and foreign languages comes from the fact that they are in fact differentially embodied. And I, I will uh, explain that in more detail uh, a little bit later. Now, um, why talk about emotions? Um, in fact, talking about emotion is, is a very uh, fundamental aspect of, of being human. Uh, we love to complain about the weather uh, or how we feel or, or, or share happiness. Uh, and uh, as you know, American psychologist uh, Fussell uh, explained, the per interpersonal communication uh, of emotions is really uh, fundamental. Uh, how well we are able to express and understand uh, emotions is really into, uh, important to interpersonal relationships and individual well-being. Um, this struck me when I read this the first time because I was thinking about um, uh, students who uh, spend some time abroad um, and who typically experience this kind of difficulty in that in the first few weeks when they are abroad, um, the foreign language does not yet allow them to um, verbalize what they feel or to understand 
uh, subtle emotions in uh, what they hear from uh, interlocutors. And, and it, they, it may be unsettling if you never have experienced <clears throat> the problem uh, of expressing how you feel uh, in your first language. And suddenly you are in a context where it is problematic. Uh, it, it is a very unsettling uh, experience and it can be a cause of foreign language <clears throat> anxiety. So uh, communication of emotions is really uh, a, a subtle uh, interaction of different uh, aspects. Uh, first, uh, the ability to infer the emotional state of an interlocutor, uh, which is absolutely critical to interpret uh, the content of uh, interlocutors' uh, utterances. Um, also the implicit social rule that one does not express how they feel. So um, your boss may not tell you that he feels in a bad way uh, or, or feels unhappy, but you will have to infer his emotional state through the things he says or, or doesn't say. So it, 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 is, it can be pretty hard um, to understand, even if somebody is lying to you and say, oh, I'm fine depending on how uh, in, in the English language you say, how are you? And the answer is fine. Well, depending on the intonation, it may mean really that that person is fine, or in fact, that it's just the opposite of fine, but the person doesn't want to uh, go into detail about it. So most people use uh, indirect cues to their emotional state rather than describing it directly. Uh, and so it really is important that you know the conventions uh, of the group in which that person uh, functions and, and that you know the person because some people um, will talk about their emotions more or less uh, and, and you, you, need, you automatically compare what they are saying now to their usual uh, behavior or the usual way they uh, discuss how they feel. Uh, so uh, Aneta and I have both published uh, a book on the topic. Uh, Pia Resnik uh, in 2018 also published a book on uh, multilingual verbalization and perception of emotion. Um, and, and it is an absolutely wonderful topic because it is so amazingly complex. Uh, so many things um, intervene in communication of emotion. Uh, that, that you, you never get bored um, studying it. And, and it is typically also uh, about um, multilinguals lived experience. So um, it, it, it's great to hear um, good anecdotes uh, about people's um, experience in uh, understanding or misunderstanding emotions and expressing them uh, in the wrong way. Uh, it's easy to express them in the wrong way, in fact. Um, uh, so uh, everything to do with emotion is really about social pragmatics. Uh, so how is an, exp uh, an emotion expressed appropriately? Uh, it, it depends really on so many factors. Uh, it, it depends on the place, uh, talking to somebody, depending on whether you are in a pub or in a church, uh, will mean, will, will have, uh, will influence the way uh, you discuss uh, emotions. It depends on the interlocutors. So uh, is the interlocutor the same age and gender as you? Uh, it depends on the topic. Some topics uh, are taboo in some cultures, uh, maybe taboo depending on whether your interlocutor has just suffered loss or illness. Um, and uh, I, I quite like the quote by uh, Zheng Dao Ye, uh, a Chinese immigrant in Australia who was unsettled by how often Australians uh, say things like, oh, I love you and, and, and uh, seem to be a little bit over the top with their positive emotions and with their use of endearments. Uh, but whereas she felt that she was not like that, that her sense of self was Chinese. She prefers to express herself her feelings and emotions in the Chinese way, which is subtle, implicit, and without words. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, in a later paper, 
uh, she describes how after uh, spending three years with her new husband in Australia, she returns to Beijing um, and um, her parents uh, accompany her back to the airport when it's, it's time to return to Australia. And uh, in contrast with the first uh, departure to Australia, she decides that she will hug her parents and tell them how much she loves them, something she had not done the first time. And so she hugs them and she tells them how much uh, she will miss them and they hug her back and, and they have tears, etc. So I thought that that was really insightful because it meant that although she claims there in 2003 that she feels Chinese inside, she, she may feel Chinese inside, but three years in Australia kind of acculturated her to being more open about um, what she felt uh, and not hiding her emotions and then her, her parents uh, re return the emotion. So that's really uh, one of these things that I find particularly fascinating. It is how we acculturate into uh, new ways of behaving uh, and uh, in new ways in uh, expressing and communicating our uh, emotions. So it is difficult uh, to recognize uh, emotions uh, specifically uh, in a foreign language. Obviously you listen to verbal cues. So what words is your interlocutor using, uh, but also uh, vocal cues. So what's the pitch, rhythm, timbre, speaking rate or intensity? Uh, is the person playing with volume, whispering or, or shouting? And then obviously uh, visual cues uh, you, you watch your interlocutor's face or, or body language, and all these uh, indications help you calculate uh, what emotion that interlocutor uh, is, is feeling. Uh, and I remember when I was at Birkbeck, um, um, when I joined Birkbeck in 1994, at my first staff meeting, I was completely unprepared uh, to read uh, the emotions of my uh, new colleagues who all seemed incredibly polite and, and there was no shouting, no hitting of fists on the table, things that I had witnessed at uh, departmental and faculty meetings back at University of Brussels. They seemed extremely stiff upper lips and, and I was kind of um, taken aback, I, I thought, wow, they all seem to like each other. And then I realized that, of course, they didn't like each other, but that they, the way they expressed their emotions was very subtle. And it took me uh, some time uh, before uh, I got it. Um, and, and then um, I, I realized that, in fact, I could speak French in the French departmental meeting, and that gave me an edge uh, over them because their French was excellent, of course, uh, but, but I, I had uh, superior pragmatic resources in French than in English at that point. And, and over the years I have learned. So now I know exactly uh, when uh, somebody says something uh, in a meeting, uh, whether they are genuinely uh, interested or not interested, because I, I realized, for example, that the word interesting means the opposite uh, of uh, what it seems to say. Uh, interesting, that, that's the real interesting. But interesting means I couldn't care less, please let's go on. Uh, so it, it takes a while. Um, one of the pioneers in this area of research is Ellen Rintel, uh, who did research with um, uh, foreign language learners of English. They, they uh, did a summer camp, an EFL summer camp, and uh, she had them listen to um, emotions expressed by, uh, record, uh, by actors in 11 recordings. Uh, and um, she noticed that uh, those uh, foreign language learners who were more proficient did better at recognizing the emotion. Uh, also that um, Chinese speakers seem to do worse than Spanish and Arabic speakers. Also, the Spanish speakers seem to be doing better than the Arabic speakers. So, in fact, the more removed the culture was, the harder it seemed uh, at similar levels of proficiency 
to recognize uh, the emotion. And Graham and colleagues uh, repeated this and found uh, similar, um, ha had similar findings. So um, I was uh, interested in this and, and, and did research uh, on this with a former PhD student of mine, Pernel Lorette uh, and Nada Alcarni. Um, and uh, we um, produced video recordings of a British actress uh, playing out uh, six, the, the six so-called basic emotions. Um, and uh, we collected data. Uh, we, we, we put these recordings online in a questionnaire, asked uh, 557 first language users of English and 881 foreign language uh, users of English. We asked them to guess what emotion was being portrayed. And we assumed that it would be harder for the foreign language user to uh, guess right. And it turned out that that had no effect. In fact, uh, first and foreign language users were just as good uh, in, in recognizing uh, the emotions. We did find that um, in the foreign language user group, those with higher levels of proficiency did better. So that was kind of expected. We also found the cultural distance that Wintel had uh, described. So our Asian participants had more difficulty in guessing the emotion than uh, the Western participants. We discovered that it was also linked to uh, participants' uh, level of trait emotional intelligence. Those with more int uh, emotional intelligence were better at recognizing the emotion, which makes perfect sense. Um, and we also discovered that it was linked to age of onset of learning the foreign language. So an early onset uh, was linked to better recognition and it was linked to modality. Uh, so uh, our participants uh, performed significantly better uh, when they had both image and sound rather than just sound. And uh, I will show you a little graph of that. In uh, here. Um, so you see, uh, it's what I just explained there, the, the, the graph on your left. Um, there was a significant difference. Uh, the L1 users did significantly better than the LX users when they did not see the actress. However, if they did see the actress and did hear her talk, then uh, there, there was no much, uh, there was no uh, difference at all. Uh, this is something that we kind of anticipated, although it was interesting because um, I, I remember how hard it was when I started to have uh, telephone conversations in English uh, and how I struggled because uh, the, the interlocutor could not see my face where I was going, huh? what are you saying? What, what is this? Could you repeat this? Um, it's, it's really hard to have a conversation if in a foreign language, if you don't see the face uh, of your interlocutor. If you do see the face of your interlocutor, it, it, it helps. And then we found uh, the anticipated pattern also, as you see that uh, our Asian participants uh, did significantly worse than uh, participants from different uh, parts uh, of the world. Um, so uh, to come back uh, to the, the work then uh, that I, I did with uh, Aneta and, and on which we based uh, our two books. <clears throat> we designed a bilingualism and emotion questionnaire. More than 1500 multilinguals filled it out. It was also one of the very first uh, online questionnaires uh, on that topic uh, in applied linguistics, I would say. Uh, and what we found was that the first language was typically preferred uh, to communicate emotions. Uh, and that the first language was also typically uh, reported to have uh, the strongest uh, emotional uh, resonance. And so to uh, try to explain this, uh, Aneta uh, digged into the psychological uh, literature and uh, found that uh, the emotionality of the first language is probably linked to the effective linguistic conditioning that children get when they acquire languages. They acquire languages uh, with full involvement of their limbic system and the emotional memory meaning that words are linked to images, smells, uh, facial expression of interlocutors, of parents, of sisters, or brothers. 
Um, and uh, in contrast, uh, languages that are learned later in life, uh, I call them l access languages learned after the age of three, uh, rely more on declarative uh, memory rather than implicit memory. And uh, this may explain why uh, they produce weaker responses and a feeling of detachment and disembodiment uh, when, when uh, a person hears words or expressions uh, in that language. However, we also found evidence of secondary socialization that dis dislodged uh, the first language from its emotionally dominant position. Uh, typically multilinguals who had fallen in love uh, with a person using a foreign language who had moved to that person's country and had acculturated uh, and emotionally acculturated into that language and culture. And, and for them, that language became uh, the, the dominant language and, 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 and the emotionally um, most resonant uh, language. So it means that the first language, the stronger first language is not uh, a law, um, law of nature. And looking into sources of uh, individual variation, we discovered that it was very much linked to uh, the profile of the participants, their linguistic history, the present language use, and a number of uh, social biographical uh, variables. So early age of onset, uh, naturalistic acquisition, all contributes to using that language more for emotion later in life. Of course, also frequency of use. The more you use a foreign language, the more you will use it for uh, expressing of emotions. Also, if you are socialized in that language and if you have many interlocutors using that language, all those variables played uh, a role. <clears throat> so, um, what one of uh, the early fun studies was really about uh, language preference for swearing, and we discovered that our multilinguals uh, uh, preferred their first language uh, for swearing and, and swore uh, significantly less in languages that they had acquired uh, later in life. Also, interestingly, uh, the same pattern emerged when we asked them about the emotional force uh, of the swear words, and, and multilinguals again felt that the, the swear words in their first language were absolutely more powerful than those uh, they had acquired uh, later in life. And then uh, I came across this uh, wonderful paper by Katie Harris and colleagues um, who used uh, skin conductance uh, measures uh, to compare how uh, Turkish English bilinguals who were doing psychology uh, classes with her, uh, with them at uh, Boston University, how they reacted uh, to um, more, uh, a list of uh, more or less equivalent words in, in Turkish and English. And uh, she found that there was no uh, significant difference between uh, new, uh, the, both languages for neutral, positive, and negative words. However, the uh, difference became uh, very significant when uh, the participants were listening to reprimands in their Turkish uh, language and taboo words uh, in Turkish. Uh, they reacted much more strongly than the equivalent words uh, in English, despite the fact that they were in fact equally proficient uh, in English and Turkish. And so uh, in uh, one of the recent uh, studies on this topic with uh, uh, friends and former PhD colleagues, uh, we looked at the um, differences in emotional reactions of Greek, Hungarian, and British users of English. When watching television uh, in English, it was in fact research funded by Euronews. Um, <clears throat> and we designed a, a measure of emotional reaction uh, with four items, uh, frequency of feeling emotional when watching the news in English. I must say when I watch the news in English these days, I, I feel emotional, yes. Um, how frequently do you uh, uh, feel emotional when watching films? Uh, how frequently do you laugh when watching a funny film in English? And how much, how much do you trust uh, a news report in English? So these are in fact different aspects uh, of uh, emotion. Uh, our participants were recruited via Euronews. Um, it was a, a, a random sample. So we had 271 British citizens, 282 Greeks, 271 Hungarians who were all living in their home country. And uh, what we discovered was that there was 
uh, the expected significant difference between L1 and LX users in that the, the, the British participants reported um, higher, uh, stronger emotional reactions compared to the foreign language users. However, there was also uh, a significant difference between the Greek and the Hungarian uh, LX users. And, and that through us, we had not expected that. We expected all the foreign language users to be below uh, for first language user uh, level. Um, so we, we wondered whether that might have been linked to um, the status of English uh, in Greece and Hungary. Because in English, uh, in Greece, uh, English um, is, has been taught at school uh, by dedicated English language teachers for many years. Also in Greece, uh, films are shown in the original version with subtitles uh, in Greek. Uh, whereas in Hungary, uh, a lot of the English teachers had converted from teaching Russian uh, to teaching English. So the quality may not have been the same. And Hungary also has a tradition of showing films uh, in dubbed uh, version, uh, which means that it is less likely that you hear uh, English uh, or, or that you watch uh, a, a movie uh, in English. Um, trait emotional intelligence turned out to be a, a significant predictor uh, also, but only for the foreign language users, uh, not for the first uh, language users. So our conclusion was that watching television, uh, watching films in the original version is really a good way to pick up the social pragmatics of emotion. Uh, and and the, the the other conclusion was that we should not think that all foreign language users are equal, uh, depending on the history of the language uh, in the country, the uh, results may be uh, quite different. Then going back to uh, the, the, the bilingualism emotion questionnaire, we uh, had invited our participants also to uh, comment on uh, how they felt uh, about their different languages for expressing various emotions and for swearing. And we had this interesting feedback like Bellen who says, you know, I prefer to express my anger in L2 Italian. Uh, I don't hear just how bad it is. So I probably hurt people more than I uh, intend to. And Theodora, oh, it's so easy to swear in English, uh, much more so than in, in, in Greek. I, I don't really hear how bad these words are uh, in English. And then uh, here is a, a picture that always makes me smile. Um, sales in Japan, uh, something that is uh, hard to imagine uh, at, uh, in, in an English speaking country. Uh, you certainly wouldn't see fucking sale uh, for Harrods or, or any of the shops uh, in London. So um, the, 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 the last study I did on swear words was on the C word, which is the, the most taboo word uh, in, in English. Um, and um, I collected um, data from, as you see, over 1,000 first and foreign language users of English and discovered that, in fact, the, the uh, foreign language users of English um, don't understand the meaning of that word as well as the first language users do. Uh, so it, it's a, a female sexual organ. Um, also, the foreign language users underestimate just how offensive this word is. And in fact, they use it even less than the first language users who don't use it very much either because it is such an offensive word. So um, I guess the fact that it is so infrequent uh, means that it keeps uh, it, its um, offensiveness. Um, then I uh, don't want uh, you to think that I'm only interested in dirty words and angry words. Uh, I'm also interested in the words of love. Uh, and um, so with a, a former uh, student, we looked into uh, how uh, cross-cultural couples uh, express uh, their emotions and whether having to express them in a foreign language makes it more difficult. Uh, as you see, we had 429 participants. And there was a, a wide variety of opinions on the topic. For one third of the participants, it was not a difficulty, it was not a problem. However, half of them said, well, yeah, there are some limitations. 
And, and the foreign language, you know, if I tell him I love him in the foreign language, it doesn't sound quite as strong or genuine uh, as if it would be uh, in my first language. Uh, also, a minority of participants complained about feeling um, fake in expressing their emotions in a foreign language at the start of the relationship. However, that typically um, evolved over a couple of weeks and months. Also, emotionally stable participants had fewer uh, fears about uh, losing intensity in communicating their emotions. Um, uh, we were surprised to find that our female participants were more likely to adopt the partner's language. And uh, in interviews we had, uh, half of them mentioned constraints, uh, whereas um, in fact 25% re reported the opposite, namely liberation uh, in the uh, talking uh, about emotions in the foreign language. And here are some examples of the categories of problems uh, cited or the, the categories of themes. Um, so uh, I love you being less meaningful in one language than in another um, or uh, struggling with limited vocabulary or, or saying that in fact language was not a problem that sex was the way to communicate and, and, and lingua franca was English but that didn't matter. Um, and then uh, the ones who complained about the constraints uh, that, that uh, using these words in the foreign language, it sounds like a joke, it doesn't sound uh, serious, but then on the other hand, it can be liberating. You can say, I love you more easily apparently in English uh, for that participant uh, than in her uh, Swedish first uh, language. So that's definitely uh, a pro, uh, an, an, uh, an advantage. Uh, as you say, as you see, uh, nearly 20% of our participants said that they never got over that problem. However, uh, slightly over 50% said that in fact, um, they, they, after a couple of months, they had learned to um, appreciate the emotional resonance of, of emotion words uh, in the foreign language. Uh, of course, these couples were also experiencing specific pragma, uh, pragmatic uh, difficulties. Um, especially uh, the, they were complaining about not being able to express subtle uh, emotions in a sophisticated way, or, or they expressed emotions non-verbally through silence, for example, something their participant uh, didn't uh, understand. Um, and then um, we also realized that code switching uh, was very much linked to emotionality of languages. Uh, so we had an item on uh, what I, uh, what um, uh, do, do you switch between languages with depending on who you are talking to and depending on what you are talking about? And what we uh, discovered was that um, the, the interlocutor uh, had an effect so that code switching was most frequent with friends, less so with people uh, that, that uh, were not as well known to uh, the speaker, uh, and that in fact more um, code switching happens in emotional uh, conversations and conversations about emotional matters rather than uh, on neutral uh, matters. And typically the code switching happens from uh, the LX towards the L1, like Evie, uh, who talks about uh, her partner who, is, uh, who speaks Berber, um, they argue in Dutch, but sometimes he switches to Berber. And Christina also explains that uh, despite using English with her husband, uh, when she gets really upset, she switches to Catalan, a language he doesn't know, uh, but um, he probably has learned a couple of swear words in Catalan. Uh, I think it's linked to um, the fact that when you feel emotional, you can experience a kind of an emotional avalanche uh, that it takes too much time to uh, translate that in the foreign language and, and that you hence switch uh, to the language that allows you catharsis and, and quick release of your emotion. Uh, and, and hence these emotions spill over uh, in the first language. And then uh, there was this um, interesting quote by one of our participants, Vali, who says that um, she code switches to English uh, probably uh, it is some distancing strategy. 
And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And, and um, uh, a psychotherapist read this, uh, Beverly Costa, and contacted me and said, you know, I have read this quote in your book. Um, we need to do research on this. Uh, as a psychotherapist, I'm really interested in this. And so we did research on this and, and we, we, we got uh, an award, in fact, for, for that paper from the British Association of um, uh, Counseling and Psychotherapy. Uh, we collected data from psychotherapists, multilingual and monolinguals, uh, and we discovered that the multilinguals were better able to attune to their participants, whereas the monolingual therapists were more likely to collude uh, with them. Uh, we had some interviews with therapists to probe their views and, 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 and try and understand um, their, their uh, code switching uh, practices also uh, with their clients. And then uh, the following year, we decided to focus on, the, on clients. Uh, so we collected data from 182. Um, we we've discovered that multilingualism of the therapist seemed to promote greater empathic understanding. And that for multilingual clients, their, multilingual, their multilingualism was really a crucial part of their personality, of their self. And they liked it when the uh, therapist paid attention to this and took this into account. Uh, and they also, uh, we also found that language switches in therapy are more frequent when the emotional tone is uh, raised and that it can be used either to zoom in or zoom out. Um, and, and obviously uh, th this has uh, practical implications for therapists and we have been trying to raise uh, awareness uh, about this uh, in several papers and, and seminars. And the most recent uh, contribution on this is uh, with a former PhD student of mine, uh, Sally Cook, um, who uh, collected data from uh, people who had been tortured uh, because of their sexual orientation and um, who uh, were uh, in therapy in London, um, uh, group therapy. Uh, and Diane uh, explaining that the English language uh, is my uh, place of safety. Uh, it, it, it allows me, it enables me to visit my pain. So what happened to him was, was too horrible to discuss in the first language, but English allowed him to uh, talk about it. Uh, Bronte also uh, expressing myself in English about things that happened to me, which are horrible. I think I cut that out. There is not so much emotion uh, towards it if I'm speaking in English, uh, but in Luganda, there would be a lot of emotional attachment to it. Uh, in English, you don't feel it. So, so uh, this distancing uh, was uh, absolutely crucial. What we discovered also was that the multilingualism was dynamic, meaning that how they felt about their languages changed over time. Um, and uh, Bronte, uh, preferred English, uh, the foreign language for intimate relationships with other men, but uh, explained that in fact, he preferred to use his Luganda uh, to fight for human rights uh, back in his home country. So it's not that the, what, that, that the language is uh, totally uh, in, in one category. In fact, the languages are, um, have multiple values uh, used differently in different language domains. Uh, also, another participant, Gabriel, who was slowly starting to appreciate his first language again, um, though uh, through uh, love of poems and songs in the language. So uh, originally he had rejected everything to do with his first language after the torture, and now he's slowly getting back into it. So th this, I think, is an important point that, that nothing is ever, is ever static uh, in uh, multilingualism. So to conclude, uh, communicating emotions in a foreign language, it is not easy. It's, it's more difficult than grammar rules. Uh, it's an important aspect of social pragmatic and social cultural competence. It takes time to master this uh, and it has real world consequences uh, in the sense that as learners and users, uh, we all need to be aware of local norms to express an emotion uh, and recognize emotions in the foreign language. So I understood after a couple of uh, staff meetings with my British colleagues, for example, that uh, for a, a Brit who raises his right or her right eyebrow, that means very strong emotion. Uh, so I have learned to read 
their faces and, and read between their stiff uh, upper lips. And uh, another real world consequence is that psychotherapists need to be aware of the difficulties uh, and of, of the uh, indications that code switching uh, may give them um, and, and how important clients' multilingualism uh, is to them, uh, something that they are not always necessarily uh, aware of. And uh, here are some references, and I'd be uh, very happy to answer uh, any questions you have. Thank you. Okay, so now this is uh, the time for the question session. Thank you very much, our um, distinguished speaker. It was an excellent lecture. I'm very grateful for this talk. Now, uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, 